Mark thy calendar, Shakespeare's first folio is coming to UMD. So what's all the fuss about? The first folio published in 1623 preserved dozens of the Bard's most famous plays. 18 of them had never been printed before, including Macbeth and The Tempest, and may have been lost without the first folio. About 750 copies of the book were published in 1623, and only about a third of them are known to exist. So here to tell us more is Dr. Krista Twu, one of the first folio organizers at UMD and professor of medieval and Renaissance literature. And Matt Rosendahl is also a first folio organizer and director of UMD's Catherine A. Martin Library. And thanks to both of you for being here. Really appreciate it. Exciting times. This, for somebody who I presume to be a, a literature junkie, this has to be <laughs> pretty exciting. <laughs> Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the first time that the folios have ever toured the United States in this kind of a comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. And we're just so thrilled that UMD and Duluth can be the premier site for Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We'll be the only place in the state. Yeah, you know, we gave a, a real brief introduction, but you know, talk a little bit more about what a first folio is and why this is so important to uh, to history. Well, the a folio itself is a big book. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if you take a piece of, if you take a piece of broadsheet sized paper, mm -hmm. and and you fold it over once, you have uh, you have a folio size uh, collection. You gather them together mm -hmm. and you make a big book out of it. And I've actually brought a facsimile of the of Shakespeare's first folio, so you can see it's very it's a very big book. Um, it's a deluxe sort of book. It had beautiful material in it, like the Druzet portrait. Um, and um, you know, it, when we think about books that were designed this way and were this type of, of, of beautiful object, um, we can compare it to the 1611 edition of the first edition of the King James Bible, mm -hmm. for instance, which was uh, a very similar size. So years ago, back in the time when Shakespeare's first folio was first put together, uh, they weren't really done for projects such as, as his, were they? Weren't they were more Bibles and scientific books, things of this nature? Right, right. They were, a, a folio was considered, you know, a presentation sort of book. Uh, a Bible this size would have been displayed on um, an altar lectern oh, or sure. a, a pulpit lectern. And so there were beautiful presentational types of, of objects. Um, most of the books, for instance, uh, we talked about the King James Bible, which was printed in a folio size. And uh, compared to the prevailing Bible of the day, the Geneva Bible, most of them were printed in mm -hmm. what's called a quarto size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you take that folio, which you have two pages, you fold it again, now you've got You've got four leaves, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's called a quarto. It's a good handbook size. Mm -hmm. A lot of Shakespeare's plays that were published before the first folio was published were published in this yeah. size, um, one play at, at a time, one play per volume. Um, uh, we think they were probably used as prompt books and sure. mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Matt, That's tell us when and where. Uh, this is going to be displayed at UMD. This is a big deal deal for the school. This is a very big deal. As Krista said, this was the first time that uh, the folios uh, are going to be touring the country from the Folger Shakespeare Library. And it's in celebration of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. So uh, the folios traveling around the country making one stop in each state and it's coming to we Duluth. We got it. <laughs> we got it. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be in the Tweed Museum of Art October 4th through the 26th and the grand opening is October 6th. Mm -hmm. So what does UMD have to do to prepare to bring uh, a really important document like this onto campus and keep it safe and yet still allow people to share in it? You know, there were preparations that went into making sure that we were ready for uh, uh, HVAC controls, that the temperature and humidity are in a very strict range to be able to protect the book while it's here. We have to have security on hand at all times, obviously, to make sure the book is safe. But really, we took advantage of what was already here, the academic and scholarly strength sure. at UMD, the interdisciplinary work that we do, and most importantly, the connections with the community. Sure. The community really has made this possible. Krista, is Shakespeare still being taught in high school today? Yes, it is. It, it absolutely is. It's part of the high school curriculum, um, and it's, part of the, it's still part of the English major in college, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, I was talking to some of the high school teachers, and they're 
they're teaching Shakespeare in their junior and senior year. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. We have field trip <laughs> groups planning to come in from all over the I state of imagine. Minnesota and Wisconsin to wow. see this. Mm -hmm. Matt, what was your first introduction to Shakespeare? Do you, do you remember or do you have a, a, a favorite Shakespearean piece that uh, you draw upon? Uh, yeah, I'll admit it was probably begrudgingly in high school <laughs> being introduced to it. Uh -huh. um, but it's seeing the plays and really seeing it come to life on stage that has meant the most to me. Mm -hmm. And there'll be plenty of opportunity of that during the next month with Othello being performed um, by Wise Fool Shakespeare Company the first two weekends of the month. Pericles is going to be performed in our own library and theater mm -hmm. in the round. There's lots of great opportunities to interact with it. Mm -hmm. Krista, what, what do you think it is about uh, Shakespeare that makes him so relevant still today? That, that young people are still discovering him and college students are discovering him and getting excited about those works again? Well, I think it has to do with the universality of his themes, of his characters. When Shakespeare was writing, he he wasn't presenting original material himself. He had used different sources from histories, from folklore, from Chaucer, from Boccaccio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so already he's dealing with material that has a long life behind it, and he's giving it new life that is has been reinterpreted and re remixed from the point that he put it on the page all up until we're reading it now. Um, Shakespeare really, he really is for everybody mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. sense. When we, even when we look at the book itself, one of my favorite pages in the book is the, um, it's this page that is, um, is, is by John Hem Hemming and Hen Henry Condell, the editors, and it's to the great variety of readers. Mm -hmm. So even as they're printing the book to, to the great variety of readers, they're imagining a very, very broad audience. Mm -hmm. um, we, Shakespeare comes at a moment in history where so many of the paradigms in terms of philosophy, geography, uh, science, and cosmology, they're all changing. And so much of that change uh, that burgeoning modern world is presented in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. He writes in one of his last plays that he ever wrote, The Tempest, which ironically is the first play uh, presented in the first folio. He writes a character wondering at the brave new world in front of us. Mm -hmm. that it's, uh, Miranda says that. And, you know, her name, Miranda, in Latin, it, it means, hey, look at that. <laughs> well, well, we have a brave new world in front of us right now, so maybe people can glean something from that. Thanks for coming in and, and talking about this. We will have a graphic up that shows uh, where people can find information about the events that have planned, but congratulations. It's really, really neat to have that coming to Duluth and to UMD. Thank, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. We really hope thank to you. see everybody. Mm -hmm.